I interviewed mayoral candidate Helen Gim for a segment on NBC 10 at issue in April. What you're about to see is an extended cut of that, more than we had time to show on TV. Now, at the time of our interview, there was a lot of discussion about the proposed new 76ers arena in the city. The city of Philadelphia had just announced that it would do an independent evaluation of that project, and Gim had acknowledged in a debate that she had met with Sixers executive David Edelman. That's where our conversation begins. Well, let's start our conversation uh, with something that has been in the news. The city announced this week that uh, it's going to do an independent evaluation of uh, the proposal for a Sixers uh, arena. Um, you have said that at this point you are against that, pro that project. Uh, what do you think about the city doing this independent evaluation? Do you think that's the right thing to do? And if you're elected, what would you do with that information? Well, I mean, I think that there needs to be impact studies that happen and should be a regular part of the process. As soon as the project was introduced, there should have been a set of independent evaluations that occurred around it. But I think the bigger issue is not just about having this conversation be about one project. The city overall needs an injection of economic vitality in regions uh, all over Philadelphia. I certainly am going to be somebody who leads, who won't wait until a Sixers arena, if it ever opens its doors, to lead an East Market Street revitalization. I think that there are things that we can do right now to get things going, including putting small businesses in, making sure that we, um, you know, close, we can close down the streets for vibrant arts festivals. We can put working artists to fill up empty storefronts. Um, but this city needs a big vision on how we're going to revitalize and invest in neighborhoods and economic development across the city. It's more, it's bigger than just one project. You, you did acknowledge, um, this week that you had met with uh, uh, David Edelman uh, of the Sixers. Your comment was, I met with David Edelman, but not to discuss anything. And you said you did not discuss the Sixers. But then later in a debate, you said you made it clear that Chinatown must thrive and billionaires don't deserve public subsidies. Why was your initial instinct to downplay that conversation? Well, because I think I meet with people all the time, and that's what mayors do. You know, newsflash, I have meetings and I go places. So, you know, I think it's normal for people like myself to be able to meet with people who are having conversations about the challenges within the city and how to grow Philadelphia. And I will continue to have that. But my bigger point is, is that Chinatown and residents have to thrive in the city of Philadelphia. And this is a very important issue because our tax base actually relies on residents right now. It relies on people being able to see Philadelphia as a place to call home, to grow a family, build a future. That is the future of the American city right now. It's not just about big box projects. It's not about like, you know, things that that usually take enormous amount of subsidies or are uncertain around their public financing and other types of financing initiatives. It's really about a city that's leaning in on a strong residential a growing base of, of, of people and small businesses. And that means I'm invested all in on a safety agenda, a livability agenda, and affordability agenda that keeps people actually anchored here. We're going to talk about your safety agenda in just a moment, but to, to, to wrap this up, uh, did you tell him whether or not there would be any possibility for an arena a new arena under a GIM administration? We did not discuss the arena. We had a general meeting. This was a general introductory meeting about the city, and it's the kind of meeting that I have with people all the time. And I ask you about sort of how you talked about that meeting and, 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 and downplaying that conversation, because who a mayor meets with and uh, where they go, how they handle that, um, that reflects on them. It reflects on the city. We had that situation. Certainly there was the situation with the Union League where you attended an event there after criticizing it. Uh, there was a situation with Eagles tickets um, regarding how to or whether to report those with Bobby Heenan. So, so my question uh -huh. to you is, can Philadelphians trust your judgment? So I think that my 20 years of track record around how I do things and how I've led whole campaigns through the city, where there were lots of questions about who I meet with and where the direction of the city goes. I made one thing clear in that debate, which is I'm a mayor who's looking out for the public interest. I am not having backdoor meetings in rooms and cutting deals that so many of establishment electeds have had. And um, there are plenty of people who are running for office who've been in this world uh, for a very long time. Um, um, there are plenty of people who are under investigation right now um, for for untoward things that have been done potentially within their campaigns. I'm somebody who plenty has been upfront. I have been there have been a number of, of 
of uh, candidates in this race who have had ethics fines and other investigations, conflicts of interest lobbied against them. That is not me. Um, I have been somebody who has been dedicated to the public interest time and time again. It's how I've led my life. It's how I'm going to lead the city. And it's why I think I've been uh, somebody that Philadelphians clearly trust. There was one issue um, with, with the teachers union um, uh, donation, I think not in this race, but in, an, in another one. You're talking just specifically. In but this. that had nothing to do with our campaign. It had to do with the teachers union. Um, let's talk about your safety plan, um, which we've gotten a first look at um, and talk about some of the things in there. You've said you will declare an emergency, improve 911 response times, deploy more officers on foot and bike patrol. Um, and even if, if I look at just one page of it, you're talking about investing city funds to upgrade surveillance cameras, investing in training for detectives, investing in technological updates, uh, upgrades, funding and expanding restorative justice initiatives. You told me, though, the day that you announced your campaign that the police department has the budget it needs. So where do you get the money for those things? Yeah, so let's let's be clear that I, the, the police budget is the largest in history. It has grown by 25%. We have enough money within the police budget to handle many of the things that we need to be doing. My interest, and you saw that in our, in our safety plan, we had a very clear state of emergency. We're going to coordinate a lot of these departments. The issue isn't about just the spending. It's how we're leading and marshalling all of our forces, pulling them together with a common mission towards improving community safety and making sure that residents feel safe and are safe safe. Um, but I'm also very clear that, uh, you know, one of the most important areas that we're not doing and that I think has we've had an inordinate focus on just one aspect of safety in our city, which is solely around policing. And that is why we have the problem that we've got. Because when you look at what safe cities actually do, they invest in people. And my primary agenda is not just around um, managing a crisis, but actually trying to end one by doing the things that 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 we need to do right now. Um, at and, our and education, I say, your your plan does include more than just policing in it. There there is a point where it talks mm -hmm. about uh, funding block parties in a box where you can get city provided moon bounces, There's more food than and, that, and bubbles. Yes. yes, there is so, much more than that. It's, you know, it's at our, sixteen pages, but. Mm -hmm. You're talking about things that are not involving policing. So tell me why you include something like yeah, that. I appreciate that. So, you know, last week at our launch uh, for our education plan, um, there was a elementary school teacher named Anjali Rivera who had talked about how she had, you know, buried far too many of her young children. And um, she talked about uh, her 15 year old cousin, Nico Rivera, um, who had been shot multiple times the previous month. And you know, she made it very clear about what an invested city need to look like to save our young people, that we have to do so much right now to embrace our young people and pull them back into the fold, that we have to reclaim them from the streets and that we have to provide mothers and loved ones like herself and Nico's mom, Elaine, with the resources and the supports that they need to go on and live full, stable lives. And that's why the primary efforts within my agenda are things like supporting victims and survivors of violence to make sure that there's fast and free crime scene cleanup to make sure that we create a funeral fund. We talked about the importance of guaranteed employment in neighborhoods that are deeply impacted by violence. This is a guaranteed employment pr program for young adults 30 and under so that we can have them feel like there's opportunity and hope and possibility for them. And I've talked about making sure that there's safe passages for children to and from school because so many young people are being harmed on their way to and from school. So we're expanding safe passages routes. We're making sure we're coordinating with our school district and with SEPTA. We're keeping uh, schools open later in the uh, evening so we can stagger dismissal times and you don't see so many young people pouring onto the subways um, and, you know, giving them engagement and opportunities for things. But I want the city to know and I want every mother like Elaine and Anjali and every educator and um, Philadelphian to know. I've got all eyes on our on our uh, on our city, on our neighborhoods, and our young people. We need to clean up and brighten up these neighborhoods that have so long been left behind. And I'm looking to finish the work I started on city council to deliver that. I wanted to ask you about one specific thing regarding um, regarding young people. Um, you talk about um, a, developing a plan in um, not all schools, but some schools. I think about 25 of them um, in areas where more than 50 percent uh, of those enrolled are um, in, involved in mm -hmm. gun violence. Um, 
Do you have that plan? What, what would that look like? How would that work? Yeah, so we have a, we, two years ago, I rolled out an anti-violence, a youth-powered anti-violence agenda. And we talked about how violence is so deeply concentrated within communities um, and amongst groups of individuals. So um, a lot of that work is going directly to two, two different ways. One is taking a look at young people who are deeply impacted by violence. Um, so looking at areas where they connect with us, so at hospitals, at our juvenile justice uh, center, um, um, and at our schools, we want to make sure that there's a coordinated approach that makes parents part of the solution and provides like an almost case management wraparound approach for housing, health care, education, family reengagement, um, and supports them through it for a long term process. But the second area is recognizing that certain schools and neighborhoods and communities are overwhelmingly impacted. And it doesn't matter whether you're a direct victim. Um, you, you know, the whole school community is impacted, as we can see when young people are grieving for the loss of, of children and uh, their classmates, um, it can have a devastating effect. So in those schools, we absolutely want to make sure that at the high school level, we're delivering a youth employment, summer jobs program, guarantees about those kinds of things. I must have those schools be open later in the evening. They have to have the How 3 to 6 that? p.m. Uh, time frame. So I think that this is one of the areas about why we need to make sure that we're funding our after school programs. We do, we slashed a lot of funding for after school programs um, in our most recent budgets, and we need to bring those back up to where we were not only pre pandemic, but a little bit beyond. Um, we have partnership efforts, and we should consider this part of some of the anti violence work that we are looking into because it's concentrated and focused. What do you do about? Um the young people who right now, as we speak, have a gun at home, in their pocket, somewhere that they have access to. Um, we are seeing young people become victims, but also become uh, shooters. Um, what do you do about the guns that are right now in the hands of young people, teenagers who are not allowed to have them? Yeah, so clearly if anybody has them, they will be held accountable. But the bigger issue is the culture that makes people feel like they're so afraid for their lives that as a young person, this is the only thing you can do to protect yourself. That is partly why we have talked about that importance of having engaged actors, making sure that there's things for young people to do, um, making sure that there's guaranteed employment, um, and absolutely making parents part of the solution. I've talked a lot about the importance of bringing back our parent university programs, bringing them into our, uh, you know, into our school system, through our parks and recs programs, through DBH, uh, through our Department of Behavioral Health and Public Health Outreach. Um, you know, these are all efforts in which we try to make families stronger and more resilient than ever so we can become better at raising young people who don't feel like they have to be afraid all the time um, or have to react to everything. It's why we're leaning in heavily on some of these programs around mental health, um, teen wellness, restorative practices, conflict resolution, um, different ways in which teens handle stress in their lives. I don't think people understand how much stress has gone on in a young person's life through COVID, through school closings, through potentially the loss of people in their families, the loss of people during COVID, um, through unstable economies, and you know potentially through evictions. Young people are uprooted from almost everything that they know to be stable and strong. 3,000 young people have almost dropped out of school since, uh, since the start of this school year. We need to get them back into the fold and reclaim them from the streets. And we'll have to leave it there. Helen Gibb, thank you so much. Thank you. That was my conversation with mayoral candidate Helen Gibb. You can see more of our coverage of the mayoral race on NBC10.com.